Hi, my name is uh, Peter Swears. I'm the Chief Technology and Operations Officer at Interact. And I'm Rick Davidson, Senior Vice President of Banking and Wealth Management at CGI. So Peter, you know, this is the first time I've been here. I've known you for a number of years. It's the first time I've been here, your new office workspace. Yeah. I know you still have your office space downtown and you're there every once in a while. But when I look around to this blend of some of the office things that you have around, your personal paraphernalia, your bikes, et cetera, what, what made you think to, to build this out here? What, uh, you know, what happened during the pandemic? What are we, 18 months in to, to get you to, to build this, this area for you to work? Yeah, well, you know, the uh, the pandemic hit, uh, I guess, March when we uh, we in a weekend pivoted to uh, move all the Interact staff to uh, working from home, uh, me included. And uh, we basically shut our offices down. I think when we said our goodbyes, everybody thought this was going to be a two or three week event. Uh, you know, 18 months later, here we are. But, um, you know, come early summer, uh, you know, it was clearly when... Uh, you know, we knew this was going to be a much longer pro protracted event. Uh, I started to look at uh, uh, the space I was working in, which was inside, and summer was hitting, and I wasn't really enjoying my time. And uh, and you know, when when you're working from home, a lot of the fun of work, of meeting your colleagues, traveling, uh, having lunches, dinners, meeting customers, and and uh, trade shows, a lot of that disappeared. And so uh, I thought I needed to do something that got me kind of back outside and. Uh, you know, I get to see my neighbors walk by. We have, uh, you know, dogs that come in here looking for treats. Uh, you know, so um, it was June when I started and uh, I think it was July, um, a month later that it was finished. And uh, so uh, this is where I work from well, uh, generally it. every day of the week. I love it. And you know, you bring up something interesting. We all forget about, you know, we're on our calls every day. We're still doing our work. We're talking, we're having our meetings. We're talking to clients. It's all through either Zoom or Teams or, or pick your channel, but you do miss the camaraderie that you get at work. You, you, you miss the interaction that you get. And, and I think all of us need some time to, to just chill every once in a while. Still, we get the work done because we have to, but uh, you, know, you need certain things like this to, to make the days go by. What are, what are your thoughts on Interact's going back to work plans? Have, uh, I, I mean, I don't think anyone really has a clear answer on that here in Toronto, but any thoughts from you and, and your company? Well, we're certainly uh, you know, um, keeping employee safety at the forefront of any decision that we make. And, uh, you know, we're obviously, you know, everyone knows who our shareholders are, the financial uh, institutions, so the big banks. And, you know, they've already announced some of their intentions around uh, return to work and, and vaccinations and things of such. Clearly, I think we've proven that we can continue to serve the Canadian economy and, and Canadians themselves uh, working remotely. So there isn't a burning platform for us to come back. Um, what is missing, uh, obviously, is, is the face-to-face -face collaboration and the teamwork. Um, so there is a desire, obviously, to come back. We've run a, uh, a survey with our staff okay. about uh, return to office. And, uh, you know, not surprisingly, uh, you know, 48% of them were uh, less than a day a week that they're interested in coming back. Uh, and then the numbers, you know, tear up. But, you know, by and large, the majority, well north of three quarters, are less than two or three days a week is where we landed. Um, not to say that that's the model that we're building. I don't think we've landed on yet on that yet. I think it's... Uh, you know, a combination of, uh, you know, uh, we have a lot of projects in front of us, big ones, uh, you know, the RTR, pay by bank, um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so we're looking at, you know, what is the right balance to strike, uh, but always remembering employee safety and their level of comfort. A lot of our employees are commuters, uh, use public transport. Um, you know, a lot of them are not necessarily comfortable yet in getting into, uh, you know, the Metrolinx trains and, um, and, the, uh, and the bus situation, right? So. so you mentioned some interesting stats there. You said that pre-pandemic you were doing about 61 million transactions per month, e-transfer transactions, and then a year later it was 81 million. And is that typical? Are you seeing all of your channels, your digital channels, increase volumes by the same numbers or more? The, the digital channels for sure. Um, you know, I think if you uh, if you were to analyze all the numbers going backwards, uh, you know, the at the start of the pandemic, our traditional uh, EFT um, volumes were high. Uh, everyone was buying toilet paper. Um, <laughs> a lot of hoarding going on. I, I actually bought it quite a bit myself. Actually, <laughs> I bought way more than I needed, <laughs> only because I got caught up in the hype. But uh, yeah. likely, Carmageddon, like i.e., physical cards are going to disappear, and uh, you know, alias based routing is going to rule. Um, and there's a whole lot of consolidation taking place. So whether it's, you know, uh, you know, check or cash, I mean, ultimately they're all gonna, 
disappear at some point and it's going to be, you know, uh, electronic transactions. One of the things that, uh, you know, needs to be in place in a payment company is it's like hydro, right? You walk up to an outlet, you plug in, you expect a light to turn on. Right. And, um, you know, some of the payment systems weren't at that level. Nobody ever sits up at night and goes, well, I can't use Google right? because it's always on, yeah. right? And that's where we need it to be. So a year and a half into the pandemic, what does the data tell us about, you know, who's using the different electronic payment methods pre-pandemic, during pandemic, and today? How have things changed for Canadians? What does the data tell us? Um, you know, there's many, many data points. I don't know that I could cover it all off in, 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 in one question. You know, certainly, uh, you know, what, what Canadians are telling us is that, you know, they want to shop more local. Um, they're prepared to wait longer to receive their products and et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, there's clearly been a shift to, um, you know, in-app and e-commerce platforms, um, shift to, uh, you know, tokenizing your EMV card and using mobile wallets. Um, you know, so the Apple Pay, Samsung Pay that are offered by the telecoms. Um, and then e-transfer itself that used to be way more of a P2P, you know, personal IOU, IO RIC, $50 rail is now become way more in commerce related, right? And so, uh, you know, so the dollar volumes have gone up um, and, uh, you know, and the expectation of usage is, is sky high, right? You don't want to stand on your driveway, buy some tires for someone and wait for... 20, for minute, 20 minutes for that transaction or the funds to be received. And so people are expecting these things to be happening in near real time. Um, and then the demographic shift has really taken place as well. Um, you know, we had, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, we were probably around 40, 50% of the folks were signed up for auto deposit uh, in e-transfer. Now we're north of 80%. Um, again, wow. this just gets rid of the Q&A, uh, reduces fraud risk of account takeover. And then again, as I mentioned in demographics, right? I'll just use my, uh, you know, my dad as an example. And, you know, well north of eighty, and uh, you know, I don't think pre-pandemic, you know, he would have been a user of e-transfer, uh, and uh, and and now he is. And uh, you know, he's. Uh, I think you know, I'm not going to suggest he's the king of it, but he certainly talks about it. And and it's like, uh, you know, I'll just send the kids some money, right? And it's like, well, first of all, I don't need the money, Dad. But thanks very much. But uh, he's. Uh, I'll take the money. No, yeah. But uh, you know, like I, I think people are generally recognizing that um, you know, with the with the pandemic, that uh, money seemed to have a stigma around being dirty. And, uh, and how is it that we use the electronic methods available to us and that not only, you know, the, uh, the folks that were generally using it beforehand uh, picked it up even more, but the, the folks that were not exposed to it as much have, have picked it up. And, uh, and so the demographics have, uh, have gone through the roof as to who's using these products these days. And speaking of which, when I think about the massive change in, in our spending patterns that we just talked about and the, the huge increase in transaction volumes, how did you how did you ensure that the infrastructure that you're responsible for could actually handle those volumes and loads? I mean, no one foresaw this coming. No one foresaw us, as you just mentioned, not using cash anymore. Everybody's at home. Many of us, many more of us are shopping online. And, you know, so, and I know it wasn't luck, or if it was, we'll pretend it wasn't. But honestly, what, how did you, you know, how did you ensure that the infrastructure was there? I mean, I understand now that e-transfer is now designated a prominent Canadian payment system Correct. by the Bank of Canada, I believe it is. Yeah. And that only happened either during the pandemic or just before? I'm August sure. last year. August, August during the pandemic. During the pandemic, yeah. So it's kind of like, uh, as you've used this analogy with me before, you know, you're, you've got a plane flying at speed and you're trying to change the engine and the wheels at the same time. Did you have to do that or were you already in a good place? Um, you know, it, 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 um, I, th I think the pandemic was was critical in accelerating digital uh, transformation, um, but it wasn't critical in launching it. It, it, it was already there, uh, and uh, and and payments trends towards electronic transactions, uh, you know, near real time, um, had started long before the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic accelerated it, uh, and and so. <laughs> Our journey uh, in terms of modernizing our platforms, whether they be e-transfer or the TSP, um, started probably two or three years ago. Uh, Good. So certainly Good. 18 months before the pandemic. 
uh, notwithstanding, um, early on in the pandemic, when we started to hit some of the record volumes, we, uh, we were uh, tweaking and turning and adding capacity in real time uh, to, deal with, to deal with the workload so that uh, you know, Canadian consumers could continue to, uh, especially in the abnormal time we were living in, uh, you know, at least from a payment perspective, live as normal lives as possible. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not going to suggest it's foresight uh, that we knew this pandemic was coming clear. Nobody did. Um, but we were building towards the future, uh, and the future is a lot less paperless. And, and, and getting back to the program you started prior to the pandemic, and then, of course, you had to do some things during the pandemic to make sure you could sustain the availability. You know, how did you, you know, is that why you were hired? Like, were you brought in to do that transformation? Did you come in and then say, hey, the digital world is, is upon us. We need to, to, you know, to ensure that we have all the right infrastructure, software upgrades, all the different, because there's a lot of moving pieces, connectivity with all the different banks and other payment networks. I mean, what, what was the genesis for some of, for, for that transformation that fortunately you all put in place at Interact before the pandemic? Um, well, the, I think the genesis was, you know, when Interact changed kind of its go-to-market strategy, right? And so, uh, about three years ago, there was a, a move to move from an association model of bank ownership to a corp model, um, independent board, and and uh, and ultimately driving, you know, more and uh, I guess different products to market, right? And so uh, we're in the last stages of uh, of doing a major uh, on-prem uh, Azure Stack rollout, um, as you know, um, CJ is a good partner in that. Um, we had actually anticipated moving that workload to the cloud, um, but with the designation that you mentioned of being uh, a prominent payment system, uh, you know, the Bank of Canada uh, really had no interest in, you know, their services uh, living in a cloud substrate. Uh, so we had to pivot in the middle uh, of this journey. We had to pivot in the middle of the pandemic. And, uh, and so now we are... I'd say two weeks shy of launching, um, you know, the Azure Stack on-prem, which really will complete uh, kind of the e-transfer modernization from both database, hardware, network, application tier. Uh, everything will have been uh, modernized. And that's amazing. So it, it's not in the public cloud for all the reasons you talked about, prominent payment system, and, and that absolutely makes sense. But it's still going to be able to take advantage of all of the modern um all of the modern capabilities and availabilities that you get with the Azure Stack. It's just going to be on-prem. Yeah, no, that was an, a, an absolute requirement uh, for us was is that uh, any of the application modernization that we did to the platform needed to be able to consume a cloud. Um, and whether that cloud is on-prem or that cloud is, you know, uh, you know out there, um, it was a requirement. And so uh, I don't want to do it twice. Um, so as uh, regulations change with our... Uh, with our government um, or even with our board as comfort levels around moving, you know, uh, PEI, PII, payment data uh, to the cloud as that people become more comfortable with it as security paradigms change. We absolutely want to move our workload um, to the cloud. You're hearing more and more of digital ID in the media. Um, you know, the Premier of Ontario is talking about it as it relates to uh, uh, driver's licenses in Ontario, there was just an announcement about it. Uh, the federal government's talking about it. People want to leverage it for vaccine passports. Uh, so there's a number of, of plays there. And so we, you know, 18 months ago or so, we acquired a company in Ottawa called Two Keys. Um, they're uh, heavily entrenched in the space. They do work for the government today and a number of other institutions. We're in the throes of closing another acquisition. And, you know, ultimately where we want to be is to be that credential authority in Canada, you know, where you would trust uh, having your digital ID stored. A lot of interesting and, you know, pretty amazing things we've talked about to get us to this point. But what's next? You know, where does, where's the industry taking us? And how does Interact play a prominent role in the future of finance? You know, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. You know, well, certainly I think, you know, what we want to do is we want to leverage our, our brand in the marketplace, right? So, you know, our brand today is we're the number one trusted financial service supplier in Canada, um, you know, ahead of all of the banks. Um, and, and so when you look at what the trends are, and, you know, I certainly wouldn't say Canada is a, a leader in this space. You know, you look at jurisdictions like uh, the UK and Australia, you know, they're further ahead in, in, uh, in open finance. And, 
And and so what what where we are, if you look at uh, you know what we've been doing in the last little while. So you would have saw 18 months ago we bought a company called uh, Two Keys, um, you know who do um, uh, digital ID and uh, and have services for the Canadian government. Um, and then you look at uh, you know where we want to be really is is we want to be at the center of this whole uh, you know consumer directed finance right and being the credential authority in Canada today we already link uh, you know 28 million uh, consumer accounts in Canada um, we have you know very mature fraud operations that sur surround all those things and so you know we think the combination of you know the technology that we have the acquisitions that we have and the brand that we have that we are uniquely positioned to actually uh, you know from a trust perspective be able to provide those services to Canadian consumers you know when you think about you know you Rick for example if you want to uh, uh, you know provide access to you know uh, um, you know some information some financial information that you have to your uh, financial advisor that sits with a different institution you know who would you more trust to tokenize that information so uh, you know provide that uh, access and then expire that access when it's no longer needed um, you don't want to give someone access for you know at infinitum when it's not required it's if they're doing a plan for you what's that plan take is that a 60 day or a 30 day event so you provide someone access to your account information for 30 days and then it's expired those credentials need to be tokenized they need to be stored somewhere and they need to be dealt with and and we think that we're uniquely provided or uniquely positioned to provide that that service and there's no question that's where the future of finance is going well the, the canadian government has has is is been talking about it for months and months and months there's been a number of uh, of working groups of which we have participated in there's a number of standard bodies whether it be the diac we're on the board of diac um, you know, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of, 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 of movement in that space, um, but we're laggards. Uh, and I don't mean that negatively. I don't think that this is something where you want to be out in front. Uh, you don't want to be a trailblazer. Uh, but there have been, um, you know, clear paths, directions, whatever you want to call it, set in the UK. And then there, you can look at what the value levers are. Who benefited from open finance in the UK? Were the, was it the banks or the consumers? I would say in the first wave, it was actually the large FIs. And so that's not what open finance is intended to be. Open finance is intended to be about you having uh, and being the custodial and the management of your financial data, not the banks. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, it pays to, a little bit to be a follower here and learn from other jurisdictions and make sure that we get it right. So interact, participating in these user forums and making sure that, you know, our voice is heard and, and our position is leveraged is, is really key in this journey. So Peter, in order to deliver all of this change and to continue to change and all the plans that, actually more than just plans, the strategy and plans that you have at Interact towards open banking and digital wallets and all those things, where do you get the talent from? Because the last time I checked, we are in the hottest talent market in the IT space probably ever. I would say even more than in the dot-com years in the early 2000s. Right. And, you know, and, and it's a competitive market. So what are you doing on the talent front to ensure that Interact has the, the people and the partners to deliver on all of this promise? Yeah, no, there's, uh, there's, no, there's no doubt that in, uh, you know, 30 plus years, I don't want to date myself, although I'm sure the gray hair is doing a good job of that. Um, you know, there, it, it's, I've never seen a market like this, right? The, uh, you know, the, the, the number of people that are moving around, um, A, for opportunity, B, because lifestyle change because of the pandemic. Um, there's just a lot of movement in the marketplace. And so, uh, you know, talent is tough. Um, it's even tougher in the payment space. Um, there's so much, you know, modernization going on in the payment space that the that talent is in short demand. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, the Bank of Canada is trying to hire them, Payments Canada, the FIs themselves, all the service suppliers, you know, the CGIs of the world or, or us, right? And so it's, it, it's, certainly, it's certainly a challenge. Um, I think when we look at our strategy, um, you know, at foremost, obviously, is we want to keep what we have, sure. right? And so how do we deal with retention and, uh, and how do we deal with, you know, the culture and the work environment and so that people want to stay? You know, they have the career opportunities, they have the growth, and they have the lifestyle that they're looking for. So that's 
you know, clearly number one is how do we retain. Um, attracting, you know, we do have an interesting uh, brand in the marketplace. Um, we are doing relevant and interesting work, um, you know, which is meaningful for the, uh, you know, the younger generation. They do want to do work that is, uh, you know, interesting, meaningful for society, but also things that are going to let them grow um, as individuals and in their careers. And so, you know, I think those two things are, are key. And then there's, uh, you know, the other strategies. I mean, we clearly, we're never going to hire everything that we need. We have a partnering strategy. Uh, and so we look for, you know, the brands that, um, you know, have the, uh, you know, the, uh, the talent and the traction engines that maybe we don't do. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, again, organizations like your own CGI, uh, smaller boutique firms like level 19, um, it's, that's one of the strategies. And the, one of the other strategies I'm looking at now is how do I get out of the GTA marketplace? Right. right. So, um, you know, can I put on a, you know, a near shore, um, you know, like leverage like a Halifax, for example, and, and Dalhousie, a different market where maybe the talent isn't as hot as it is in the GTA marketplace. How do I do that? I don't necessarily want to go set up shop over there. So, you know, again, I would look to leverage, you know, in market players like yourself to, you know, figure out how to do that and how to make that best available to me. And just for clarity, you're not going to get out of the Toronto market. You're just going to supplement it, I assume. Oh, you know, 100%. It would be an augmentation strategy. Right. Totally makes sense. There's been talk for years about digital ID. And it's funny. We were never able to get... There's all sorts of... There's DIAC. There's a bunch of different type of organizations that are actively working and have been working on getting some form of digital ID. And uh, I would bet that because of the pandemic and the increase in digital traffic and everything we're seeing, that we're going to see an acceleration of that. You know, when you think about what the uh, consumer directed finance or open banking world is going to look like, where, you know, you as a consumer are in control of your data, but you want to provide access to that data to a, you know, maybe your financial uh, advisor. Sure. Um, who else better would you trust than to tokenize that access to that account than a brand like Interact? Of course. We already trust for all the transactions. And it's funny you bring up open banking. I mean, there's the laws in 2023 that are changing and, and mandating some changes with open banking. So we talked about, you know, how people are paying for their transactions has changed, a lot less cash, people moving to digital, e-transfer changing. But what about general spending patterns? I mean, how has this pandemic, and, and this is one of the great things about your industry your, or your company, actually, you know, you see spending patterns and how they fluctuate and the dollar changes per transaction. And. And of course, it's all confidential, et cetera, and, and you don't see individual peoples, but you see the trends. Yep. And, and what, are the, what does the data tell us? What, what are the trends and in, 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 in how have they changed during and throughout the pandemic? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that there's a single trend that you could kind of hone in on. But, uh, you know, I would tell you that early on in, in, in the pandemic, you know, debit didn't really, you know, take a big hit. Um, you know, as, as everyone was, you know, amassing, uh, you know, groceries and, you know, again, as I mentioned, toilet paper to, you know, make sure they were covered. Yeah, so our mobile wallet, Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Pay, the tap, uh, it took a tremendous hit early on. Uh, you know, that's the traditional, uh, you know, you're downtown on the path and you need a Starbucks and boom, tap. And so, you know, everything in the world shut down, those, uh, those transactions fell through the floor. Um, E-transfer immediately started to, to, to ramp up. Right. And uh, and, you know, what I was going to say, too, is, is uh, the the traditional experience at the retailers, retailers um, was what not what it needed to be either. Right. And so uh, I think everybody was adjusting to what was going on in, in, in the marketplace. Right. You look at I'm an avid golfer, as you can tell, with the golf clubs behind you. But ordering from Golf Town early on in the pandemic was a disaster. Right. Yeah. Uh, paying, ordering like not, none of their systems were connected. So. They all did work. Um, you know, Harry Rosen, my favorite clothier, um, same thing, horrible, now electric, right? They're amazing. And uh, I, I look at where where the consumers have gone now as well is, is uh, and again, I look at myself, right? I rent on my house, I do this, I do this, and it was always go to the bank and get cash. Now it's e-transfer, Yeah. right? You're, you're using what was more of a P2P, uh, a person-to-person -person payment rail. You're using it for commerce. Um, I started ordering meat uh, from a farm, uh, Meadowbrook, uh, good plug, great meat, uh, in, um, you know, out in, uh, out in the Callanan Hills. And you order, they deliver to your house and you send them an e-transfer. That's amazing. Um, there was a number of these types of situations where um, 
you know, certainly e-transfer, which again was a personal rail, became a commerce rail. And that uh, and commerce rail, uh, so, and sorry to interrupt, people are using it, I understand, maybe to, to pay their rent now. Absolutely. Which never would have happened, or probably didn't happen very often prior to the pandemic. So you must have seen the average uh, transaction size yeah. increase. Yeah, obviously the, well. the average dollar volume went, uh, you know, from, you know, pick a number of $50 to, you know, seven, eight times that volume, right? Wow. Because it's no longer just personal; it's right. personal and commercial. I well, I, I, I wouldn't say commercial, right? Like Sorry. we we have just launched Interact Instant um, in the last month, which is really all about connecting business accounts. And Got so e-transfer is all about alias-based routing. And so it's I don't need to know Rick's banking information; I just need Rick's cell phone number or his email address, and I can send him money. Um, the commercial rails are all about uh, account-based routing. And, and, and what it's meant to really uh, replace or displace is EFTs. Um, so you're doing real-time uh, deposits. So these are five-second irrevocable transactions wow. um, that are uh, meant for commerce uh, in the business world. Um, but, I, but I think what's happened with e-transfer is, is that uh, you know, it's, it's become a commerce rail as it relates to people, individuals conducting commerce, whether it's home renovations or... You know, and you're standing on somebody's driveway and you're looking to Kijiji their tires from them. And, you know, like, why bring cash when you can do uh, transfer. transfer? A lot of interesting ground that we've covered today. Um, so thank you. I appreciate it. And I think everyone who's watching this or will be watching this appreciates it as well. Um, and I guess if we were to put a theme together for this whole thing, it's really about transformation. You've transformed this garage. It's now a working space. You've transformed the the culture, the people, and definitely the technology within Interac in order to allow Canadians who have been transformed by the pandemic to be able to conduct their business, <laughs> to use transformation again, possibly in a, in a transformed way. Um, you know, what's, what's next? You know, what, what, what's, what's the next level of transformation that, that you think that, and I guess this will, this will conclude our conversation. What, what would you say is the, the next transformation that either the consumers or Interac or, or or society even should be looking forward to or, or get ready for. Yeah, you know, well, I think we're on a journey, right? And uh, you know, we are the consumers are, um, you know, what the end station looks like. I don't know that I could articulate that. Um, you know, I, I do know that uh, you know when you look at the global scene, um, you know, whether it be the UK or Australia, um, you know, who we tend to uh, you know follow pretty quickly uh, in the financial services scene. You know, you look at where open banking is um, and you look at, uh, you know, where they are. Um, you know, the Canadian regulators look over there and they look to, you know, mimic, uh, you know, schemes that have worked over there or avoid things that haven't worked. Right. And, and so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, in Canada, you, you will see, you know, the Canadian banks are talking about it. Uh, the Canadian government is talking about it. Uh, you will see, uh, you know, consumer directed finance or open banking, um, you know, and, 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 I, I think for us, you know, where that is is interesting and where we can make it, uh, um, um, you know, more digestible, I guess, for the Canadian consumer as well as uh, the the, uh, the FIs, is you know today just through e-transfer alone we link 28 million uh, uh, banking accounts, right? 28 million. So you know we have the line share of the you know, connectivity required. We have that brand, as I articulated earlier, of the number one trusted brand in financial services. And so, you know, I, I think the, the next big pivot that you'll see, you know, uh, you know, for us as an organ, I don't mean pivot, it's not that we're going to abandon what we do around payments, uh, but the next new, uh, you know, major thrust as a company would be in that whole, you know, credential authority uh, space, being able to tokenize access uh, not just a payment vehicle like an EMV chip card but you know tokenize access to uh, people's accounts and information uh, and 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 ultimately you know kind of getting into that you know space of being um, the credential authority and then moving into other things like why if you can token it tokenize an EMV card why couldn't you tokenize a Ontario driver's license sure you know one would have to ask the consumers how many wallets do you want how many electronic wallets do you want like an electronic app for your health card? Do you want an electronic app for your driver's license? You know, one for your uh, federal government access, your passport, or do you want one passport, right? One electronic wallet that has all of these things in it. And, and you know, that's, you know, maybe uh, an aspirational statement. Uh, you're never gonna get 100% of the market, 
uh, in terms of consolidation in that space. But uh, from an interoperability perspective, um, you know, that would uh, make a lot of sense. And it's it's certainly from a, where we, in terms of what the thought leadership that we try and put into the marketplace is the areas that we want to be. Well, it sounds like we're making you're making the right investments. There's no question, and you're absolutely right, where open banking has gone in Europe and the mandates the government's put in place and the, 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 the digital identity and token work that's happening that, uh, that interacts well positioned to play a significant part in, uh, in this journey. So, so stay tuned. This journey is not over. We're only part way through. There's, a, there's open banking and many other exciting things, as Peter mentioned, coming. So I guess we'll transform away, Peter. Yeah, it's great to see you. Absolutely. Thanks, and, uh, We'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.